here today. They, uh, Carl always has interesting uh, thoughts to share, so in addition to being a signature sponsor of the show, we, we love hearing what he has to, to say to you as well. So, Carl. Hi, Carl. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to New Orleans. Uh, some interesting facts that Brian obviously just put up. Hopefully they'll dovetail into what I'm about to show you. Uh, unfortunately, not realizing Brian was here, I don't have ESPN logos in the presentation. I have some others. So hopefully he's already left before he gets a chance to see this. But obviously what we want to talk about is video, what's happening with video, how it affects the service provider business model. And that's the theme for today. It's not only going to be in theory, but also we're going to get a chance to talk about some real world data that we've been able to gather from some of our customers. So I suspect all of you have heard about the cloud. This is nothing new in, in any sense. If you're as old as I am, you may remember client server. Many of you remember, how many hands client server? Remember client server where the data's out here, the data's back here. Okay, so what's in the cloud and what is happening? So fundamentally, all service providers that are looking at going forward are dealing with the cloud as all content providers are starting to place their content in the cloud. So Netflix obviously is one that we've used many times. Um, if you think about what's happening with Net Netflix, and as a matter of fact, Brian just spoke about this, streaming is starting to head towards all different types of devices. But it's not just for Netflix. Apple, as you're well aware, for many of you that have multiple Apple devices, they went ahead and did what I would call relief from discomfort. For those of you that have multiple Apple devices and you try to sync them, it became a very difficult task. They announced iCloud, which allows you to fundamentally synchronize all of your systems because ultimately, guess what? There's one data set in the cloud. So how does the cloud affect the service provider business model? Well, if you think this through, the service provider really exists, if you will, at the edge of the cloud. What's going on from a subscriber standpoint is even more interesting. I'm sure all of you have kids, or most of you have kids. This chart shouldn't look particularly surprising. The number of devices that are sitting in the home connecting to content in the cloud is increasing at a geometric rate. It's always nice to say exponential, but it's actually geometric right now. And for me, my kids don't ever really watch TV as we traditionally think of it. They watch things through devices and they watch it when they want to watch it. So what's driving this? Well, the secular trends that have been driving our industry for decades are unchanged. They drive all of the IT industry, but specifically commerce, increasingly global. Communications, increasingly mobile, and I would add a word to mobile, which is personal. Because if you think about the nature of the devices that folks carry around, they are uniquely personal. In addition, information increasingly digital, there is still an enormous amount of information that is stored and handled in an analog fashion. But increasingly it's being digitized and obviously most information that's being captured today is being captured in a digital format. And last but not least, if you add these things up, it enables a culture that is increasingly virtual. And I don't have to go through it. There have been many examples uh, from the Arab Spring with Facebook at its core to any number of examples of where culture is becoming increasingly virtual. And if you have any questions about that, look to your children. What's the common denominator of all of this? In essence, what does it all sum up to? Well, it all sums up to video. Because when you think about these trends and how people interact, Video will be the way people interact, not only with each other, but with content, learning, telemedicine. These are all video applications. And when we say video, we don't mean TV. We mean video files, streaming video files. So let's go ahead and take a look at some data points. We now have, in our 10 years of existence, um, we just crossed the 1,000 customer mark. And one of our newer products called Compass has enabled our customers to start to realize what's happening uh, inside of their networks. And they've been kind enough to share all of this data with us. 
A couple of insights we'd like to draw and share. Number one, many of you have heard the 2080 rule. So 20% of the users drive 80% of the traffic. Well, actually, it's, it's even more aberrant than that. In that 2% drive 20% of the network traffic. So for those of you that look into the traffic in your networks, perhaps these figures ring a bell. But it is very, very peaky. So again, 2% of your users consuming 20% of your network capacity. Here's another data point that ties more directly into what we just saw from ESPN. So let's take a look at streaming video users. So what this chart represents, if you look at the entire circle, it's not users, it's those users that use streaming video. 6% of streaming video users use almost half of the network capacity around streaming video. So again, when you think through the impacts on your network, what can we draw from this? Well, before we draw a conclusion, data size, 10 gigabytes of information on average, but only three HD movies. So this is just a but said differently, here's a conclusion to draw. If you think about that peaky distribution, and obviously this is not a curve, it's extrapolated, what this says is you're a few HD movies away and some more subscribers away from doubling the network. Well, it's no surprise, if you double the number of streaming users, you're going to double the capacity because streaming is fundamentally driving disproportionately the capacity needs in the network. Again, move from 6%, that's 6% of those streaming users that drive the network, to 12, you've doubled the network. So what do you grapple with? Is it an aberration? Or is it a canary in the coal mine, i.e. an early indicator? If you study all of the previous trends that have been internet-based, we believe that this is an early indicator, that these are early adopters, by the way, demographically, clearly age-based, but as they grow up, they sweep through the demographics and take command of the network infrastructure. So what's a service provider to do? Well, keep thinking about it because 3D is one thing, but 3D is actually just stereoscopic. So you really have two streams of whatever the content is that you're moving. So you're replicating the human vision in stereoscopic view. Now you have ultra-high definition TV on the horizon. By the way, 2012 Olympics will be broadcast in this fashion. If you go back to HDTV, long before HDTV was really even available, ESPN was on the forefront of that. There are a number of content providers that started to, in fact, take things in HDTV and distribute it that way. The same is going to happen here. And ultimately, when you get to this kind of ultra-high definition, I mean, the only thing beyond ultra-high definition is I'm standing in front of you definition. Because these pictures get so realistic that I'm not sure what is beyond it, but I'm sure there's going to be something coming beyond it. So that's what's in the future. So how do you look at the network? Well, let's take a test. Let's dream for a moment, or hallucinate. And let's pretend that none of us have networks. And we're a new entrant with a virtually unlimited balance sheet. And we were going to go and build a network. How would you build it? Would you build it with copper? Would you build it with coax? Well, we, we believe that the way you would build it is fundamentally, it would be an all fiber infrastructure with antennas sprouting up off of it. And that devices would be connected for the most part across a wireless PHY and bits moved around in the access infrastructure on fiber. And that's how the network would appear. So for us, it is clear that that is the destination, albeit 100 years from now, 
10 years from now, 20 years from now, or if a new entrant shows up with an unlimited balance sheet, now. So the question is, how do you go about evolving there? And for us, again, there is no right answer. It depends on where you are coming from, what your balance sheet looks like, what the competition is in any given area. Gone are the days of making rolled out decisions on network deployments because competition is quite different, demographics are different, subscriber demand is different, and so you find yourself having to actually make much more individualized decisions depending upon where you are in the network, the quality of the infrastructure, the balance sheet of the company, what the competition is like. A much more challenging environment. So our goal is to go help you do that, but it is very different than the days in the past where you literally could roll out a service. And more of that thinking comes when you start thinking about the business model. We talk, everyone talks, about broadband. Have to deploy broadband. We need more broadband deployed. But what broadband actually for us is about is it's a different business model long term. So broadband is sort of the base, but if you think about what it enables in a business model, it's an entirely different business model in how you go about deploying services and the cost of running them. So as an example, one of the things that we just spoke of is gone are the days of rolling out a network from the switch out. So many of you may remember the advanced intelligent network where I could mine the switch for services that I could roll out to my customers. If you've watched kids today, they're not particularly interested in that. They're particularly interested in getting the latest device and showing up in your network and expecting the services that they want to be available. Let me say that again. They're going to show up with a device that you may or may not have seen before, and they're going to show up in your network, and they're going to be looking for services that they expect to get. And if they can't get them from you, they'll get them from somewhere else. And they're only a few text messages away from their friends to figure out where they can get it. So the whole mentality is very much subscriber in, customer in, and how you think about the network and what has to happen. So the network, your service architecture, your company has to be built around very fast moving services, almost rapid prototyping those services, trying things to go to market. So it shifts the business model in pace. And one of the challenges, and we believe one of the big advantages, is recognizing where the service provider is in this value chain. So lots of discussion around IPTV, over the top, how do you monetize, where, do I, where can I go? I think the only way to answer that question is to first start thinking about where are you in the network, where are you in that value chain, and how do you go serve those customers? So let's take a look at this. If you remember the cloud that we spoke of earlier, in essence, every service provider has a data center that sits at the edge of the cloud. Some service providers are large enough where they've started to go and offer their own cloud services. But let's just take that data center model. We used to call them central offices or head ends. Let's take that data center model and expand upon it. The cloud is a wholesale infrastructure. The subscriber on the right is connecting to the cloud to get their content via the access infrastructure to the data center. That's the service provider. That is a retail infrastructure. Wholesales on the left, retails on the right. The service provider sits at the fulcrum of those two network infrastructures, those two content distribution points. The service provider is uniquely positioned to be able to understand what IP addresses, what devices the subscriber has and correlate them to the physical pipe, if you will, that they're coming down. That is a unique position that the service provider has that no one else has. Content? Not so unique. So why do I highlight those two pieces? Because ultimately, value add is going to be driven by, in essence, looking to provide services for which you have a unique position in the market. 
So let's talk about this a little bit more and let's expand upon it in a different model. 1990, model on the left. Different technologies, different rules. So if I wanted to watch video, I went through satellite or from cable. If I wanted to have a mobile device, I was with a wireless provider. If I wanted to have voice, I was with a wireline provider. I had different technologies, different physical interfaces, different protocols. In some cases, I had an analog voice stream that was converted via a pulse-coded modulation scheme into a 64 kilobit bearer channel, which was then ganged up into a DS1, which eventually came back to a piece of fiber over a twisted pair of copper to a piece of fiber that was in a sonnet infrastructure. In other environments, I had a video stream that was analog, that went over an analog piece of coax that actually went to a piece of fiber that was analog modulation, back to an analog head end. All different. What changes that are a bunch of things, but number one is IP. So internet protocol is a media independent transport layer. Legislation comes down, 1996 Telecom Reform Act, and everybody is in everybody else's business. And we come up with new terms, the double play, the triple play, the quadruple play. Very clearly today we live in a, a world where there isn't a play. It's either an infinite number of plays or it's all one play because it's a set of services moving over that infrastructure. So the industry starts to reform into a communication service provider, a search engine, and a storefront. So when I connect via my service provider, I immediately, for the most part, go to a search engine to find what I'm looking for, and then I get to a destination which is typically an aggregator, a storefront. So a Netflix, an iTunes. That's the model. So where can you go to monetize? Well, can I go down? Possibly. But there's a big barrier here, which is scale. So even the largest service providers in the world that might have 100 million subscribers don't have billions of subscribers the way a search engine does. So the scope and scale makes this a challenging movement to start looking down into the content to try to monetize. Rather, we would advise the following. If you take this new model and you think through that dividing line, well, the opportunity is clear. Think about that strategic position in the network. The opportunity is to focus on the customer. Focus on the subscriber and start to think about what unique services can I provide to them that I am best placed to provide. So let's go back to all those devices. Any of you ever had a hard time setting up a VCR? Setting up a device? Now I'm blessed, I have a 10 year old son who acts as my IT organization. Because I have no idea how to run any of this. And I grew up in the technology industry. Most of us would like to have an IT organization. Who's best placed to be the IT organization for me? In my view, it's my service provider. Why do I say that? Well, I'm the subscriber. I have a set of IP devices. They're connected via an access network to a data center. And my service provider, if they choose, can understand everything about me. They can understand that I have problems long before I know I have a problem. And then I call the Geek Squad. So the tools are becoming available, some are available, to allow a service provider to instantiate a level of IT services without rolling trucks. So I can have billable service offerings that are instantiated at low cost. And you can start going down this list, and many of you, I suspect, are trying out new services, whether they be security services, uh, health monitoring services, you name it. One of my favorite Usage-based billing. How many of you have thought about usage-based billing or grappling with usage-based billing or potentially saying, you know what, it's coming, but I'll wait for one of the bigger guys to do it before I go do it. So here's a question. When I come to you and say that 2% of your users are using 20% of your bandwidth, many of our customers reflexively 
say, I'm going to use usage-based billing to get those guys. <laughs> it's almost a punitive way of thinking. So let me challenge you on usage-based billing for a moment. If you can characterize what your subscriber is doing, you can probably tell whether or not I'm a telecommuter or I'm a conspicuous consumer of entertainment. You can tell when I'm using things. And I submit that if you understand the usage of the customer, you can start to tailor packages that tie to the way I look at things. So somebody that's a telecommuter has a very different usage pattern than someone who's a conspicuous consumer of video. So how about if I use usage-based billing rather than just saying it's a valve where it's a gigabit, two gigabits, when you get to your 50 gigabits, most consumers don't understand what a gigabit is or a gigabyte. How about if I start to tailor the package to I've got the power entertainment user package or I have the telecommuter package? So I would challenge all of us to start thinking about how do we take this information that we can potentially have and start to tailor solutions that become value solutions to the customer as opposed to how do I monetize a particular stream? So food for thought, if you would. So what does this mean for the future? How are we going to go about building things? Well, for us, it's very clear that these networks have to evolve. And you have to do it inside of a very limited CapEx stream. There is no unlimited balance sheet. And you have to do it so that you're competitively advantaged as opposed to competitively disadvantaged while meeting the subscriber's ever-increasing demands. So number one, we want to make sure that we're building networks that have the highest service capacity because these curves continue to go up. I don't believe there's a presenter that you will see throughout this entire Telco TV show that won't talk about the next thing coming. It's 3D, it's this. And every one of these curves goes up and to the right. Without having that capacity built in, where you avoid the opportunity to go out and break things in the network that you're having to fix because there's too much demand, having that capacity for us is foundational. The second piece is making sure that the infrastructure is flexible enough where unanticipated services the network can still handle. This goes from the data center all the way to the, the, to the subscriber's device. Not to the DMARC, not to the subscriber, but to the individual devices that they have on their wall, on their desktop, or that they're carrying. All of this is done with a model of the most capex efficient, lowest opex model. That's how people are going to succeed in the future. And for us, when we think about what that network looks like, ultimately, you're pursuing one infrastructure. Because again, if you think about that destination from a network architecture standpoint, clearly IP allows all of these things to converge. And so over time, it's far more efficient to run one network than it is to run five or two or three. So since IP allows that convergence and the waveguides in the form of fiber and wireless, further that convergence, our view is to continue to drive towards one unified access infrastructure. And so with that, I hope some of these have at least have you, have you thought a little bit about business models. Um, but I would leave you with, please make sure that as you think about your business model, you keep your eye all the way out on that destination as to what the world will look like as we go forward. So with that, Joe, are you coming up? Thank you much, folks. Thanks, Carl. You know, I mean, last, at last year's show, I think there was a lot of sort of, 